Becoming a narrator and learning a whole new world of audiobook narrating is an awesome journey for those that are getting into it, but it certainly has its challenges. To make it happen, you have to be consistent, learn the performance side of things, and the technical side of things. I want to find out the narrator's side of the story. I'm Ryan May, and in each episode of the Home Audio Podcast, I'm talking with a wide array of narrators in their adventures of doing just that. From veteran narrators to beginners just learning the trade, learning their strategies, their wins, and what's still ahead for them. When beginning the narrator journey, there are a lot of pieces of the puzzle before you can learn everything. There's recording, there's editing, there's learning the equipment. Where do you go from there? So I want to help you out in getting your journey started. I want to give you my four-step narrator guide. This guide is a basic breakdown to help you get started in audiobook narration and where you can go from there. If you want to download this, you can head to thehomeaudioproject.com slash narrator and sign up. As you'll hear in this podcast, there are tons of steps to take, but with drive, determination, and some bumps and bruises along the way, you can make it happen no matter what background you come from. Today's guest is Curtis Michael Holland, a teacher, an actor, and in his words, a global nomad. Curtis is the type of narrator that not only loves to tell stories, but he tells the stories that are true to his heart. Narrators tell stories, but Curtis finds the connection and makes his audience feel that connection. His passion for performing is clear and staying true and honest with himself really shows that passion. I know you'll feel it too after this conversation. So as I say in this podcast, the narrator story is just as important. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Curtis Michael Holland. Thank you, uh, Curtis, for joining me on the Home Audio Podcast. Thank you for paying me to be here, Ryan. <laughs> that's right. 50 bucks. That's all you get. That's, that's the charge. <laughs> Careful. You're going to get like too many, uh, too many inquiries now. Yeah, inquiries. I know. No kidding. No kidding. I want to start off with just having you let us know who Curtis Michael Holland is, man. Sure. So he is, I am, um, I'm Canadian and I'm a drama teacher and an actor and a narrator. And I kind of just... I'm I'm also a global nomad, so I live in Hong Kong right now, but that's just basically because I go where I need to go to be successful. Uh, I've lived in a few different continents, so I'm just, I'm a person of the land. And and the funny thing is, like, I don't know, like, my people have been, like, you know, immigrants, slaves, hunter-gatherers, all, all that kind of stuff. So I kind of, it, it just, it's like I'm carrying on the legacy. I'm just going where I need to go to make things happen. And I've just been, I've been working online. That's, That's where I've got awesome. all my jobs actually. Really? Every single, every single job that wasn't for minimum wage, like flipping burgers and stuff has been like online. I'm just realizing that now. <laughs> so I just kinda, I went for it. And, and at the time, a lot of people weren't doing it. And, and I was like the only, I was like the only person of color. Cause, cause back then it, it was kind of like, the, the the saying was white faces sell places mm. as for the teachers in these private schools. Sure. And I was like, well, huh. and my first boss, he was like, he was like, uh, he was like, well, Curtis, you, you could pass for a dark Italian. And I'm like, oh, and at the time I, I took that as a compliment. I'm like, cool, I could pass. <laughs> so it, it was kind of like I went back in time when I came over here, but, um, but I, I still love it, and, and things are getting better each year. We're in like we're basically in the '90s now. That, that's where we're at with the <laughs> with the racial climate. <laughs> right on, right yeah. on. So, so tell me how you got to become a narrator. What brought you to that journey, and and how often do you narrate? Cool. So, well, I I used to do a lot of community theater, and when you do community theater around the, around the world. There's usually a director or or like an owner of the company, and they get all the money. <laughs> like, no offense, if any of you guys are watching this, like I love I love you. I had so much fun working with you, but 
they get all the money and they get like tons of money because they charge a lot more for ticket prices out here. I was like making no money and putting countless hours on top of my theater teaching job. And I was like, well, this kind of, you know, this isn't fun. I was living alone in Shanghai for a bit before I got married. And, and I kind of was listening to a lot of podcasts and, and audiobooks and stuff like that. And I was like, I really like this. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved microphones and stuff. So I started my own podcast for a bit. But that, that was like, it was an anonymous teaching podcast. And it was like teachers having anonymous conversations. And we'd all have code names because we didn't want to get fired. Right. And, and it was just like, it was explicit. It was honest. It was fun. And after that, I was like, well, I want to be me too. <laughs> so I found out about narrating audiobooks. I signed up on ACX. Mm -hmm. And those were my first, my first audiobooks. <laughs> right on. So, how many yeah. books did you have under your belt just on ACX when you first got started? When I the first summer, I did three, and one of them was like twenty minutes. I know they say you shouldn't do that, but like, yeah, yeah. I didn't know, and it and it like the cover was cool, the author was cool, and I I just wanted experience, and it was like a twenty minute audiobook, and it took me like. <laughs> 20 hours <laughs> but um yeah that's where i started and now i do i try i try to aim for two a month but sometimes it ends up being three okay yeah, yeah. so that's good that's like that's a good problem to have then right so you're you're actually staying busy when you don't really want to i guess i mean yeah it, it, it works out right <laughs> yeah no it all works out like and, and i love it and i only do titles that i believe in or that i really i'm excited about Sure. Um, yeah. And I mean, you could you could say it's a publisher title and I'd get excited about that. So right. so it's kind of a, a wide range of, of different things. What inspires you to do it and what also continues to inspire you? Yeah. So I think I just I've always loved storytelling and I, I you know, I love consuming stories and hearing them and just getting latched onto things. But I also like kind of uncovering silenced voices, really. Yeah. Because there are there are so many things that and so many texts that weren't around when I was younger, and I'm not that old, right? And and now they're here and and they're all like there are so many. And I think it's just amazing to to tell story to tell people's stories, really. Especially mm -hmm. when it's when it's so connected to them. Like when you know when you're like, oh my gosh, like you're the main character. Like one 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 author that I, I'm working with, I was like, Oh yeah, like I'm worried what's gonna happen to that to this character in the third book. <laughs> and he just broke down and cried. And I was like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm like, and then he apologized. And I was like, ah, I know this is really personal to you. And I'm like, and now I'm realizing you're the main character. But um, wow. <laughs> so it, yeah. it's just, it's really powerful stuff. Just. Wow, man. Yeah. If you don't mind sharing, what are some of the stories that you've told that gravitated towards your, your heart? Um, I think a lot of them, like, because I, I do a good amount of LGBTQ fiction mm, cool. and even some MM romance, which isn't mm -hmm. always written by men. It's a yeah. lot of time it's written by women. Right. Um, but I, I'm like, I'm silly. Like, I get really attached to any book. So I end up crying at the end usually because I'm like, I'm not going to get to be them anymore. And then I get sure. the pickup pack and I'm like, oh, man. But but at the time, I'm, I'm like, really, I, I just get really connected to them. For example, I've done some Native American texts because I'm, I'm part Blackfoot and Cherokee. And cool. and just um, and, and I've done some like LGBTQ historical mm -hmm. fiction and things like that. And just reading stuff that I didn't know that was before my time mm -hmm. or just that I can relate to. And I'm like, yeah, I've I've been there with that. Uh, like I just, I get so emotional, <laughs> yeah, I get so no. emotional and attached to it. Like it's just, and those are the moments where you're like, I don't care that I'm not, you know, making bajillions of dollars with this, you know, like we're, we're kind of the lower end uh, on the pay scale for when it comes to voiceover, but it, it's just, it's meaningful stuff. Even though this are our first time meeting, I can tell that you get connected by that. Just the way you're explaining it to me. I feel a connection now that you've said that, to be honest, and I'm not trying to blow smoke at all. It's just no. one of those things that like I, this is why I enjoy doing this is because I enjoy talking to people and, and hearing their stories, get that connection. And now it's kind of like that seven degrees of separation type thing where like, yeah, now your stories that I haven't even listened to yet or read, 
I already get the sense just because you have so much heart around them that I can feel that connection, man. I think that's great. I think that's so cool. And I, and I love that you love to tell those type of stories. So keep doing it. You know, because you do such a, such a wide array of books, what are some different approaches that you have to take mindset wise or preparation wise mm -hmm. to get into those different roles and those different books? Well, and actually, I was talking to the, about this with another theater teacher the other day. I, I think that uh, you're, you're playing the character's truth no matter what. Like, so no matter what genre it is, mm -hmm. the words really, they frame the story. So that part, like that, that work is done. You just right. have to be able to interpret it. You have to be open to interpret it and not, not be like, well, what do I sound at? like? I, I got to go up on this tone and on that word. And this character has to sound like, like what I'm doing now. Right. Um, but you have to just, just be like, okay, at the heart of this, what was the author's intent? And who, who is this, who is this character telling the story? And, and with that, then everything else kind of falls into place. But first I just go in with an open mind and I read it and I try not to, cause, cause it takes a lot of prep work. I try not to just start marking things down and be like, Oh, that's a word. I don't know. That's a, uh, that's a good note to have. I try to just read it and take it in mm -hmm. before I get into any of the, the real preparation, which may be inefficient, but like. I'm, I'm not doing it for time. It, it still gives you the full in and out of the story, right? So you can, yeah. you get really immersed with, with what the author is trying to convey. So I think that's, uh, w whether it's time consuming or not, you, you know, that story inside and out, even if you've just read it at once. So when you dive back into it for narrating, it's like you're, you're living it with them, which I think is a really cool approach, to be honest. I think that's, I think that's awesome. It definitely feels like the pain and the characters that I do that I create now. Mm -hmm. So it's not all it's not all to waste. You fell right into exactly what you have a passion for and what you love to do, which is acting. I and work performing. my ass off. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I mean. Like that bugs me. Is just like so many people that like, and it it just it breaks my heart and it makes me mad at the same time. Mm -hmm. So many people, they just get stuck in whatever and they're like, this is it. This is my life. Yeah. I have to do this. I'm like, no, like you have to just make your own reality. I yeah. was, you know, I wasn't anyone. And I'm not saying like I'm famous or anything, right. but like sure. I'm, I'm, I've reached my level of success. I'm happy. I'm doing, I'm making money all off of my creativity. That's, that's great. I might've had to move across the world a few times, right? <laughs> but who cares? Yeah, man. Like I'm going no. to the beach after this. I don't care. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's see, that's, that's the dream, man. Like you, you've been able to accomplish your dream where you're doing what you love. You can do it anywhere, right? It's all virtual and you're just, you're making it happen, which I think is so cool, but to switch gears a little bit. I mean, since you already said that you're kind of techie, you like playing with microphones, all that kind of stuff. Talk to me about the self-engineering side of things. How difficult or how easy was it for you to get on that self-engineering side? What, what were some of the struggles and mm. what were some of the things that you found out worked the best for you? So I'm so happy that I don't do any of my post-production anymore. For mm. the first few books I did, and it was just like so time consuming, not, and like, and it was kind of fun and I was, and I was like learning so much and I'm like, cool. but even for theater, like, I don't like doing the tech stuff. I can do it to a basic degree, but <laughs> all the ideas are up in here and they come out of here. Like, that's what right. I do. I talk <laughs> and I perform <laughs> and I have these big ideas and I'll be like, um, could you just make like, say if, if I'm dealing with a theater tech, I'm like, I just want like the lights here. And then I want smoke to come out on the stage right when she says that line. And I just, I need it to be billowing as she, you know, as she comes to the crescendo and then I want the dragon to come down, but it has right. to go like boom, bang, bang. And it has to go like that. And I don't have any of the skills to do it. Right. I'm just like, I can direct and I can right. act <laughs> and, and I can run my mouth, but hey. that's, a, that's about it. And that's what I prefer to do. So dealing with the post-production for the first few books, it took me so long. I wanted to cry. I wanted to quit. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so thankful that I learned how to do it and that I don't have to do it. So on that engineering side, though, while you're narrating, how difficult was it for you to learn the punch and roll side of things? 
So the funny, like not even funny, but like the stupid thing is, and everybody who's not doing punch and roll, stop it. Just stop not punching and rolling. Just, just do it. Just learn it. Figure it out. Just everyone's worried about like pumping things out and just and getting the work. Don't even worry about what microphone you need if you can't act. Baby boy, baby girl, baby whoever. Sure. Like just figure out, just learn. There is so much free information out there. Mm -hmm. Even, I don't know, someone might learn one thing from here, even if it's just to get up off your butt and learn yeah. and go places. Just right. make it happen. I know it sounds easy, but it's not, and it wasn't. But just learn how to do this stuff before you try to do it publicly. Yeah, no, that makes sense, well, man. I mean, because it's one of those struggles that needs to be overcome, right? So, you know, a lot of people want to just do the, you know, punch in, let it roll, maybe do the clap method or the, the dog clicker method. But I was doing the clap snaps. <laughs> well, so it's <sighs> not as efficient <laughs> as, as no. some think. You no, know, it's not. What is your approach when you're when you're getting into the script prepping side of things? I know you said that you are already read the book, you know, mm -hmm. cover to cover, and then you go through. But do you mark down different character voices, accents, place of origin, anything like that? That's going to mentally cue you on your actual page. Yeah, or, for sure. Uh, OK, Um, maybe not on the actual page. I like to leave it like naked, but. I like to, what I like to do is when I go through, say a second time, it might just be a skim, but mm -hmm. I take note of a few things. And this is from a theatrical approach. Sure. So I go with point of view, like who's the character? Um, what is, what is like the, the objective of this scene? Where does it fall in the story? What's its purpose? Um, what is the setting specifically, you know, all the way down to like, is it hot outside? You know, where are we? And, and kind of like the emotional energy of things. And then I take note of which characters are in there because I do record um, character voice clips so I can remember mm, cool. who sounds like what. Yeah, that's a good yeah. that's a good idea, man, because that's uh, that can be a struggle, especially if it's probably a book that's in a series. Right. I mean, if you're needing yeah. to reference back back to a character that maybe will come back in on the third book and they were originally on the first book, you know, how do you how do you do that? So that's a that's a good that's a good tip, man. I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't have thought about that, but yeah. The, I, I just, another tip that goes with this is not only having those, those different character voices, but knowing where they lie in your body and like, so, you know, where do they resonate from? What's, what's the pitch? Mm -hmm. What's the overall energy? What's the pattern of speech? All that stuff is important to know and, and understand how you're making the sounds with yourself. Cause that's what takes you from sounding similar with your characters to mm -hmm. being really dynamic and having having a full cast within you right what's mm -hmm. what how many characters in a given book have you had to perform so many i feel like i always get like around 30 and then sometimes an author will be like oh i heard you work in this you want to do this and sometimes <laughs> <laughs> one, one time I, I did one right in it and it was fantasy and it had all these characters. And then I get a message and someone's like, hey, do you want to do a nine hour book with a British accent, uh, royalty share, 47 characters of all different dialect? And I'm, like, I'm just like, maybe if you have a budget, just because like it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not charity. What right. we're doing, we're trying to make a business. Mm -hmm. And like, I forget who said it, but someone said, um, you know, you have to have your own plan. Otherwise you become a part of somebody else's mm -hmm. like, and that just sticks with me. I'm like, yeah, I'm not one of your pawns. Okay. I do want to help you out, but we got to help each other out. It's, yeah. it's a collaboration. It's not like, no, yes, I can't. Jeez. Yeah. I don't like man. But I, I actually laughed. I was like, I'm British accent for nine hours and like, you know, working for free. It's like, right. Maybe if this was, no, never. Yeah. Right. Get a budget. Like you said, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do want to move on to this, though, because this does yeah. make me curious about the the narration and just the acting side of things in general, since you've done so much acting in your life. What are some of your your wins and fails, whether that be from the technical side or the acting side? I think like the biggest fail is just like how I judge myself, for sure, because I know I'm way too hard on myself and and when I am sometimes, and I have to, I always have to remind myself, but I bring it into 
the booth when I do an audition or something, which is the dumbest thing. Like, you just need to focus on that one task. Just focus on that one thing. Don't be like, I think they're going to hate this. Uh, they're not going to listen this far into it. Oh, my gosh. I think that character voice sounded too similar to the other. Like, you you just you can't do that. And I think that's, that's my biggest thing. And I'm not like a, a send and forget person. I'm like a send and stra- like just imagine 50 different things yeah send and stress the reason why you're not <laughs> yeah why you're not chosen for something sure so those are my yeah my biggest that, that's probably my biggest thing that, that you know i'm working on and it's it's always going to be a thing that is yeah. working on j- just because like i grew up with no with almost no roles for myself unless sure. i was you know like <laughs> the token nondescript ambiguously re- racially ambiguous friends you know what i mean number three right. and and now it's like there are so many things and a lot of the time i know that i'm going to be one of the only two or three people even considered for it so right. it's kind of like it, it's 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 a big switch it's a it's a big shift in everything and it, and it just takes my whole my whole mindset and body to kind of reset and be like okay you've been doing this forever you are talented Mm-hmm. you have a resume to back it up yeah yeah so just focus on the damn job man right like, i think i've said this before and we all know it right when I mean, we are our own worst enemy and that's kind of it happens to me you know i mean on the engineer side of things too where i'm like uh did i set that right i mean is it gonna get critiqued bad enough you know is it is is the end listener gonna notice that huh. and nine times out of ten Probably not, not at all, especially with the end listener, you know, and I think that's where actors, narrators also get that same thing where at the end of the day, the end listener, they're choosing the book because they love the author and and it's a 50, 50 blend of them also loving the, the narrator as well. I, I, I know so many people and listeners that they choose specific audiobooks just based on who's narrating it. So, yeah. And I'm like that too. I'm like, yeah. It can totally be that that thing where we get so self-critical or you guys as as narrators get so self-critical, but then that that super fan of yours is still going to pick up that book because they love what you do. And I think that's one thing that I always try to remember too, even when I'm like mastering an audiobook or editing an audiobook mm-hmm. is just like, okay, and where where are most of these audiobooks listened to in our car, you know? I was going to say audible. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, (laughs) that's true. That is true. I do remember what I was going to ask you too, because you made a point about uh, royalty share and working for free and and PFH. It's a 50-50 blend, of course, people working for royalty share or PFH. From my understanding and the publisher that I work for, all my narrator friends that do this for a living, Mm -hmm. they all recommend just working for per finished hour versus royalty share. Yeah. Is that kind of the same sentiment that you were, you suggest? And why is that? So it's what I prefer because honestly, it ensures that we're paid fairly. And if the, if the author's book sells 10,000 copies or more, great. I'm glad that you have a success, but I'm just, I'm not looking to, you know, just make millions of dollars off of one thing. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't care about that. I, I'm happy for the author to be successful, especially when they're indie authors and, and they're great and they're talented and they're getting their work out there. Like, I'm so excited for them. And if we're paid fairly, then I'm happy with that. Yeah. I don't have time to be like, you know, like paying for post-production and then waiting a, over the course of three years to make it back. Right. You know, so it's just, I, I think it, it's, it's just more fair for narrators. And then also the author gets to own, own their work. And you know, yeah. get their forty percent, right? Yeah, that's great. More, but like whatever. I don't yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna switch back to the the previous slash last question because I interrupted you there. That was my bad. What are your, some of your wins? Well, okay. So I I stayed away from talking to any publishers until this year. Like mm-hmm. I was, I'm I'm such a weird person. I'm just like, okay, like put yourself on the edge of the cliff, and then you're gonna you're gonna choose a point where you jump. Like I did that when I, before I moved overseas, I'm like, you know what? You're going to get a job by the end of April and that's what's going to happen. I didn't even have my like teaching degree and I got, I got my job lined up. So I'm just like, I'm like that. I'm like, this is when right. it's going to happen. That's when you're going to do it. So 
I've I was just working for with independent authors and and stuff like that for almost two years, and mm-hmm. then in December I'm like, okay, we're gonna make our plan. 2022 is gonna be our year because I'm turning something with a two in it, and I'm born on the second of a month. Yeah, so I was like, this is gonna be my, be my year, and I'm gonna reach out to publishers, and so like I I did that, and I don't know if you know about the speed dating thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. Very well. Okay, so I applied for that for the first time too, because I was just like, well, like, let's just do it. We're doing it. This is our year. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Curtis Michael Holland. Yeah. And so I I got in for that. And so my big win is just I got on a bunch of rosters and I started working with publishers. Yeah. And and now like almost daily, I'd say I get at least an audition for something that is connected to what I care about or who I am. That's great. That's so cool. I'm just happy. Yeah. I'm so that's my big win. Yeah. Even man, though I'm that's... not booking all these, I'm losing a lot of these. And I'm just like, hmm. I, I guess like, you know, I, I don't sound sexy enough for whatever <laughs> romance it is, or like I don't sound um, you know, like I don't have that the horror voice. Sure, sure, sure. Which isn't a thing. Right. <laughs> just my brain like saying like that. Right. Whatever. So Explain for those that don't know, what is speed dating? You basically, you apply with your demos to the Audio Publisher Association conferences Mm -hmm. event called speed dating. And that is kind of like speed dating, but it's more of a a weird way. It's like a, it's like a black mirror kind of speed dating because Mm -hmm. you, you give them your demos and your profile, and then they, they decide whether they want to hear more of you or not. Mm -hmm. Then you get thrown into a lottery. And if you're chosen, then you can pitch yourself in like a two and a half minute speech with on zoom to all these different publishers with their cameras off. (laughs) And after that, then you, you get a list of their emails and you can email them and be like, can I have work? But don't ask for work. You got to (laughs) kind of like, you got to be like, you know, and they even say they're like we know what you're calling us for you know like like you don't want to just like hang out and talk about yoga right but you just have, you have to make that human connection which it right. makes sense because mm-hmm. like any long form work it's it's like i wouldn't trust just anyone you know you wouldn't trust the same person who bags your groceries with baking your dinner right you know what i mean right so it's just yeah. like you, you got to make that relationship and and build the trust that and makes that's, sense that's speed dating and then and you might get on rosters you might not you might get a book offer the next day. You you might never hear from them again. Mm-hmm. That's just interesting. Have you been to APAC when it's been in person, like going to New York and actually doing that? No, and like that's the, the it almost seems like this all has been meant to be because I've been over here, and I right. was never able to go to anything. You know what I mean? Like right. So, just the fact that I've been able to participate in all these things, whether it be at one a.m. or not, mm-hmm. I can I still have that accessibility. So. Yeah. It's been fortunate. Yeah. And and I'm not an overnight superstar or anything like that, right. but sure. I'm I'm getting somewhere. Yeah. With it. No. I'm just there's my win. You're definitely making waves, man. I mean, you're doing 2 to 3 books a month and you're doing stuff that obviously is more meaningful to you and clearly to the author than yeah, you're 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 doing something right. So, yeah. how much fun do you have when you're narrating? Like w- within recording, you mean? Yeah, I mean anything, man. Like if, if it's like you prepping an audiobook or you you prepping a, a script, this is more just to get to know you, man. Like I'm, we all have our weird quirks or our fun, our fun stories that have, we've been through, and yeah, for sure. Um, I guess uh, okay. Before I had this booth, and before I lived in this apartment, I lived in a different apartment, and. And this was my my very first booth. It was a cement closet. It was it was like two by two. Sure. So it was a walk in. It had my clothes in it, but it was made of cement. Like what? <laughs> but I got it to sound pretty good. And not only that, but like the building was old. Okay. But there was this family above us, and I swear they had like a ghost, <laughs> because there would be these footsteps just running, like so, like a track star running, just like boom, 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 boom. And every time I would, I would open the door and I would yell and I would, I would usually like yell profanities. Like I got a little passionate and Mm -hmm. so it's like, you don't need to be running around, (laughs) go outside. Like, and I would just freak out like that. But 
almost every time then I'd be like, you know, it's, it's like you open the door, the sound is gone. Right. And you close it again and all of a sudden demons come out again and you're like, and I swear, like it raises your blood pressure. Like right. it really does. <laughs> and so one day I, I was like recording and I was stressed and I don't wear clothes when I record. Like this is all just for you <laughs> in the <Right>. audience. Um, <laughs> And so I just like, I, I went out and I had like my big glasses on and I, I like, I went out and I'm like, ah, and I just like yelled in the hallway and I'm just there in my underwear, like yelling. <laughs> and so this no, little it's... family with these like little kids were probably like, what's wrong with you? And why, you know, like, why do you need to be so quiet? And you're like naked. <laughs> <laughs> so that crazy that senile like, yeah. neighbor, that's... <laughs> That stereotypical old man neighbor that's like, get off my lawn, but you're not old. You know? so right? <laughs> they're probably like, why aren't you wearing any clothes? Like, why are you mad? Like, what are the, right. what are the glasses for? Like, <laughs> but yeah. Are they, are they like Coke glasses, like super thick, make your eyes really big? <laughs> no, they're like those 70s creeper glasses. Cause like, that's what's in style here. And it's like all I could find. So I just, right I got, you know, they're, they're like those, like <laughs> almost like those, like Jeffrey Dahmer glasses. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> why do I need to be so quiet? What are you doing in there in your underwear right. yeah, in these exactly. Jeffrey Dahmer sunglasses or glasses? You know I, I mean? wasn't doing anything weird. I was just pretending to be 80 different characters for this awesome right. sci-fi fantasy. Like, come on. Right. Yeah. It's a typical day's work. <laughs> They'll never understand. But, but now right. we have, we have a, we're at a, a newer building and then I'm in this double walled booth. Are you in a, are you in a studio bricks? No, this is a China Bricks. Um, okay, right on. It's, it's 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 a company called Tourgo, and it's it's okay. a fraction of the price, but it's it's pretty good. And everyone always thinks it's a Studio Bricks when they look at it. Um, yeah, well, I'm just yeah that yeah. proofing behind you. Yeah, it looks like Studio Bricks. That's why I was curious. Yeah, yeah, no, cool. not yet, because I like I don't know how long I'll be here too. So it's it's nice right. to have something that's not as expensive yet until I have a home base, which might be never. So right, sure, yeah, that's fair, that's fair. So. We're about to wrap up here, yeah. but I got I got one more question that I, I love to ask. Yeah. If you could narrate any audiobook, any genre for any author, whatever that thing is, what's the dream book to narrate? Uh, that's hard because I actually auditioned for for one because it was for like an author that I grew up with, a Canadian author. So I really hope I get oh, that cool. one. Who knows? But like, I'm supposed to send and forget. So thanks for bringing that back into my mind, <laughs> Brian. But um, really, I just want to, oh, I'm doing a lot of what I've, I've wanted to do. I oh. just want it to be, you know, more, more, what's that word? Commercial? Just sure. more commercial yeah. stuff. Because all the independent stuff I'm doing is like great. I'm connected to it. It's my genres that I want. Mm -hmm. um, and now I just want the publisher work that I get. I want that to be within those genres. Like basically I was, in, I was in a multicast recently and this was not from speed dating. This was just because of like whatever, someone reached out to me, a publisher reached out to me. And so I'm in a multicast of a, of a bestseller. So I'm one of the characters in that and it's a series. And this author's like pumping them out. So like Dude. the third one comes out in September. I was like, what? I just recorded the first one. So that's awesome. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me on that soon. I'm not allowed to talk about it. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that, man. That's great for being a bestseller too. Super yeah. pumped for you, dude. Yeah. So I'm pretty excited about that. I want to do like a Stephen King. Yeah. Stephen. No, I want to do a Joe Hill, his son. Yes. Joe Hill. I want to do yes. him. I'm, I'm, I think I'm an even bigger fan of Joe Hill's books, Stephen King movies, Joe Hill books. In ending this and closing this, I'll let you go so you can get to the beach, enjoy your day, do your thing. So we know we can find you on Instagram. What's the Instagram handle? Where else can we find you? And what else is, is coming up for you, whether it's audiobook related or not audiobook related? So you can find me on Instagram at Curtis VOVA because I don't know where else you can find me. I'm mostly on Instagram or Clubhouse. Okay, uh, cool. I'm weekly on Clubhouse. I, I co-moderate a room on Sunday mornings, 5 a.m. Eastern time. I'm there weekly on Sundays. What's the clubhouse then? The narrators. Uh, that it's with a few British narrators. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Right on. So it's with Anna Clements, Peter Revel Walsh, and Emma. I was gonna say Watson. Emma Griffiths. Okay. Emma Watson hasn't joined us yet. Right on. Too busy. <laughs> That'd be super cool if she did, though. Yeah. Well, yeah. 
I'll let you go, man. But I definitely appreciate you doing this, you know, with me. And your story was super fascinating to me. I know there's probably way more that we could talk about. Yeah, super, super inspiring, man. And very, very cool to hear your story again, you know, like the even just that emotional connection that you know, you were talking about earlier with the books that you what that you read and how you get so invested with it. I appreciate mm-hmm. you sharing that too, man. I think that's super cool. So yeah, yeah. man, I appreciate everything. I hope, you- I hope things don't seem like it's too good. Like there are the there are the terrible and dark moment, like it's not all great. I'm happy right. with what I'm doing, but I'm not always happy. So I sure. just hope everyone remembers that part. Yeah. That's fair. No, that's another good piece of advice, man. See, you got you got years of wisdom, man. That's how it I'm just, works. Out. I'm a teacher, and I never shut up. Like that's that's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, all right. Well, I'll let you go. You and en- enjoy the rest of your day. And again, man, thank you so much for doing this. It was super cool to talk to you. Thank you. All right, man. Okay. Take care. Have a good one. See you later, Ryan. This is why I love talking to narrators. They're people who love to tell stories and they stay true to themselves, and they have a blast while doing it. So I want to thank you, Curtis, for talking with me and showing us that passion. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss any more tips, tricks, and guidance from these amazing narrators. And if you're still stuck on where to start with audiobook narration, pick up my four-step narrator guide. Just head to thehomeaudioproject.com slash narrator and grab it there. Thank you again so much for listening or watching if you're on YouTube. We will see you on another episode of the Home Audio Podcast real soon.